Right, guys, how you doing? Richard Mann from the Man on the Mission podcast. Great guest on this episode today, Justin Featherson, ex-army officer, adventurer, climber, kayaker, living with indi- indi- indigenous, I can't say it, indigenous tribes. He's just done everything, Justin. And you can see that when he talks, he is so uh, assured in in his experiences and what he's done. There's so much to take away on leadership, on uh, on performance, on uh, on life. So you're going to love it, Justin Featherston and the Man of the Mission podcast. And if you could just take a moment, click on the button below, subscribe, like the channel. Really appreciate it. Take care, guys. Cheers. Hi, Justin. How are you? I'm really good. And, uh, and thanks very much for inviting me, Richie. No, thanks. Uh, thanks for taking the time. Really, really appreciate it. We we connected while doing a program uh, for a fr- mutual friend of ours, um, and you came and did a talk. And you know, as soon as you were doing that talk, I was like, I'm going to try and badger Justin to get get him on the podcast. And you know, appreciate you taking the time. So uh, we're at the end of a bank holiday weekend, so we're doing quite good. We've both been to the gym. I'll just put that out there for starters. Um, but yeah, looking forward to to catching up with you. It's, it's a busy time for you um, delivering programs, as we were just talking about off air there. Uh, yeah, they're almost uh, almost back to back at the moment. I've got a few days and then rough on the next one. But that's uh, it's the right kind of busy. And then I'm looking forward to a a more relaxed July and August. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the the whole thing about uh, of trying to get you on was like one of the things is you know I'm going to get you to to describe. Um, the sort of the the pockets of your career, if you like, just to set the scene for listeners. But um, there were so many things, so many there's so many areas that we can go down, and I know that whether it's the sort of leadership, some of the work you've been out exploring, and uh, I've seen images of you white water kayaking in and and tribes that you've been with, and uh, and the talk that you did when you came down uh, for the program that we're running. So there's so many different things i suppose as a start point just to give a handle for people listening could you sort of give us a a sort of a breakdown of the main component parts of of your life and career so that we can and then we'll we'll double click and dive into into those sort of areas of course uh so uh, mine is a military background just like yours i spent 18 years uh as an army officer uh, an issue with the royal hampshire regiment and then the princess of wales's royal regiment and uh, like many officers, I led on various tours around the world um, and then finished my time. So I, I resigned my commission from the Royal Military Academy, Santos, where I was. My last job was as the principal staff officer there. So it was a full circle for me. It's where we train our young men and women to become officers. So I actually spent the last two years of my career also giving back, if you like, in that very special establishment. I left at the end of 2007. So I've been out almost as long as I was in now. Uh, and uh, that's and a scary year, thing. That's a scary thing, Justin, isn't it? <laughs> when you get is, to that, I don't know where the time's gone. It seems like yesterday. <laughs> um, I'm I, like, I, oh I, my, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I left to pursue a career as a as a wildlife camera operator. Uh, other things kept coming up. So uh, now I am a. I fill my time lecturing at universities, primarily University of Exeter, uh, though I do some at the University of Ljubljana. I lead expeditions. Uh, both commercial expeditions and then expeditions to the rainforest, mountains and whitewater rivers of the world. Uh, and I have a, a passion or a personal interest in in learning from traditional cultures as well. Uh, and then I do, just like you, um, I'm involved in a lot of leadership development, um, both in yeah. the UK and overseas with both public sector and with commercial organisations. So I suppose in a nutshell, that's that's I think people call it a portfolio career. That's what I have. <laughs> So, sounds very exotic portfolio career. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, when when you when you first started talking, the 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 main drive, as I've just been uh, chatting as we were, we were uh, getting getting in touch there, um, is really about people being at their best. Really, that's what the um, that's what the really podcast is, is driving at. Whether it's in a leadership position or whether it's people, you know, whether it's an athlete, whether it's anybody in any area of life. How do, how do we actually be our best? You know, one of the things that that I think about is that whether it's a leadership position, but we think about success. 
um, and being an effective leader or being an effective high performance team or whatever it is. But if, if we're if we're unable to manage, our, if that's done at the expense of stress and pressure, and you know, the, we're just about keeping the head above water, then I, I don't consider that success. In fact, you know, something's completely fundamentally wrong um, with with what's taking place. And I think your your start of the of the talk that you gave there was about people being at their best. Um, one of the key words, I, I think, I almost see it in the headline for this podcast already is about compassion. Um, and when you sort of said that, it, it really hit. And, you know, what what is compassionate leadership? What is people being able to be to be resilient? So I suppose that's 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 the start point for me as well is, is as as per your talk is is to is to get your thoughts on compassionate leadership and how we really be at our best. Yeah, so I think it's very interesting. I, I'm a firm believer we are what we measure. And I think we place too much emphasis on entirely the wrong metrics. Um, and so it's been, if you like, a, almost a personal crusade of, crusade of mine to wrestle back the word kindness and put it back into um, leadership in business and public sector. Uh, at the very best before we could use the compassion word, but that's relatively recently. Uh, and I know that some people see it as a weakness, that uh, it's not operational. It's not looking at the right things. And, and I really, really disagree. Um, I, and I think also the most important thing is one cannot be compassionate to others until one is compassionate to self. Uh, there's, a, there's an expression by John Amici, the former uh, Brit in the, uh, the, the MBA in the U.S., who is now a psychologist, and he has an expression: "Warmth is not the death of a uh, sorry. Warmth is not the death of accountability." In other words, you can be a really decent human with strong relational skills, sense of purpose, and kindness, and that in no way should impact your business negatively. In fact, it's quite the opposite. So, mm. I me, mean, it's this idea of attendance, uh, truly attending and being present to yourself to truly understand what's going on with you. We don't take enough time to do that, to actually acknowledge those things that are happening in our, across the facets of our life so that we can actually understand what we need and ask for help. And if we can do that, then we can then attend to others most fully, be fully present, listen with purpose, understand their perspectives, their feelings, their experiences without judgment or without an agenda so that when we can reach out and give an empathic connection, a felt connection, without being overwhelmed. And, and that means giving them the appropriate help. And that's the NHS uh, compassionate leadership model that was really has been created by Professor Michael West uh, over the past few years, but came to the fore during COVID as, as an idea to just bolster and hold together that organisation under huge amounts of operational pressure. So for them, putting back kindness into their interactions internally and, of course, with their patients, their families of the patients and their communities is fundamental. And no one can argue they're not an incredibly effective operational organisation, uh, asking to do, always doing more that it could be possible to burden them with. So for me, it's bringing back that word kindness and seeing it as positive strength and not a nice to have when we're not busy, but utterly yeah. essential to connect in the way that we need. So it's a, it's a sort of start point. It's interesting you said on, on the NHS. It, it, you know, one of my approaches and thoughts around leadership is because the work that I've done in performance psychology and, and the, the, the deep study there really, and the reason for the deep study really is to, to look at this twofold, is to really sort of say, well, somebody's, you know, I think people put a pocket of leadership and they say that person should be able to lead. And, and as you said there, when everything's going well, swimmingly well in any organization, then then great, fine. But as we well know, that's that that's the rare case when everything's really working effectively. And so I, I just think that often people can be caught in, you know, the, the, the leaders in any organization when they're caught in in levels of fear or doubt or, uh, you know, the, the opposite of what we would describe of resilience when they're just making ends meet, then they're, they're unable to be their most effective self. And if they're unable to be their most effective self, then, you know, people become reactive. There's, they can't make decisions clearly. They, they can't empower people within the teams and so on and so forth. And again, 
people start to constrict down. So that that was why initially when I when I heard you was my thought around leadership. I think everyone pushes leadership, but then the other aspect of that is are people able to be in a good space to be an effective leader? And that that was what that's what I'm hearing through the work that you do. Absolutely right. So I'm a if you want any kind of organization to be effective, I think in the 21st century, there are only two components. That's creating the space and the culture for quality relationships, which to deliver the quality of thinking through trust that we need. And if we have fully felt deep connections, relationships with heartfelt trust and a preparedness to give some selective vulnerability so that there's a connection to the real people, not facades, then people will be far more prepared to take risks with their thinking and be creative. And and there is uh, emergent research that suggests that when we witness kindness being given, not just by leaders, but kindness around us, as well as when we're recipients to kindness, then one, we are far more willing to give trust to that giver of kindness. And in doing so, we are far more likely to be creative in the workplace. So it, I, mean, I, I do go back to a Harvard Business Review article, which was around diversity and inclusion, which is enough of the business case. If you have to have a business case to be a decent human being, you probably need to have a long, hard look at yourself. But if you have to go there, then there is quite a lot to suggest that if you want that trust that creates that creativity, that innovative environment we need in these very uh, exposing asymmetric uh, times, then that's, that's, that's your baseline. It's not a uh, cherry, uh, you know, it's not the cherry on top. We start with kindness. It's not something I, I suppose listeners would be, you know, both from a military background, we had this, I had this the other week was just, again, or oh, less dampened down the military bit, you know, because, because they were kind of, and you, I'm, <laughs> you, I know that you'll have experienced it. It's always that double-edged sword, isn't it? Some people want some, you know, Gucci, Gucci war stories and a bit more military. And the other people are like, Oh, don't talk about the military for God, for God's sake, because the connotations of the military. So the people listening, it's like the last word that you would think is like, is talking about kindness and, and being nice to people and building relationships and so on and so forth. So it comes a bit left field to most people's, most people's thinking. Is that, is, is that your experience? Oh, it, 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 even from last week, uh, when I was working on this program, Richie, uh, within a day, people were saying, that's not what we think of as military leadership, because all they see it is from films and the television where there's some authoritarian figure barking orders at people. And and, I, and the, the way I sort of bring them back into an understanding is, is, is sort of twofold, and that's the fact that the motto for the Royal Military Academy Santos, where we train our young men and women as officers, is serve to lead. And it's not service to nation, it's serving the people that you are so privileged to look after. And the fact that our young officers, when they are on marches with their soldiers, will still inspect their feet. So they'll take their boots off and look at their feet. Now, we have perfectly good paramedics who are more qualified, more able to deal with people's feet and foot injury and care for them. In fact, the last thing on earth I want is some 25-year-old telling me how to look after my feet. But it's actually uh -huh. what we're asking those leaders to do is to get down at a lower level to the people that they um, look after, to hold, if you like, the grubbiest um, sort of part of their body in this grubbiest of times as a symbolic act of service. And and that idea of relationship and trust and kindness and attendance to those around us is so fundamental in the military, and I think it's often completely missed. But do, you know the burning the burning question um, that's that's jumping out. There's, I mean, it's just a sort of, a, a, I suppose, to take a back step from that slightly in what we're doing is is to is to look at the again framing up the conversation. Um, is to is to sort of talk about this leadership. I'm introducing. I'm diving straight into leadership for a reason. You know, for for a listener that's listening, that a listener that's listening even. Um, that they get, <laughs> that's a good thing, isn't it? Um, but the, but but to to really dive straight into the the leadership piece. I mean, and one of the things that I want to do in the conversation and to make people aware is to is to frame that in some of the service that you've done, but also the the work that you've done with tribes and so on around the world so i, I think it's an it's an amazing thing 
the burning question coming back to that is where are people going wrong? Because we can talk about it all we want, but from my experience is that you've just talked about um, something you're doing last week, a program really powerful, but, but that's the exception, not the norm. And most of the people that I'm working with, even in global corporate organizations and so on, you know, most of the people I see are suffering with huge amounts of stress. They're literally saying to me, I, I can just about get through another 18 months of working here. That bad. You know, then they're, they're unable to, it's affecting sleep, it's affecting relationships. You know, I ran a program uh, recently and, and one of the guys w- was quite honest just to begin with, just said un- the word uncertainty, just dealing with huge amounts of uncertainty. So, yeah, I, I just I just see dysfunction, people people getting it wrong, if you like, suffering and unable to effectively lead and effectively be at their best is what do you think is going wrong? A so big I think question. A of, it is a big question, but I think it's, uh, it's what we call in moral dilemmas, a slippery slope. So no one has bothered to take the time to actually notice because it's, it's, it's too challenging. Um, so we, we used to live in that good old VUCA world that, that uh, 1990s military expression of the, uh, a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Uh, that's that's so, if you like, so inappropriate now. We've moved so much further on to an even more challenging role. So the acronym that's sort of the new kid on the block to describe our living, working environments, both locally and at home and across the globe, is this idea of Bainey. So brittle, um, anxiety-driven, uh, non-linear, and incomprehensible. And, and simply the idea around this is... So, is sorry, big... Justin, yep. can, you, can you say that again? What was So the, the new mnemonic, the new kid on the block? Is Bainey, so brittle. Bainey. Yep. So brittle, and I'll sort of expand on it. Uh, that it's so brittle it leads to anxiety, and that in itself leads to uh, an inability to see the relationship between cause and effect. So that's the end is the non-linear. And that when we look at a given situation within our lives, it can appear incomprehensible. Um, And what they mean is that before COVID, before a war in Europe, and I would argue before an energy crisis, and we can go back, and of course, before a banking crisis, um, we were very, we had confidence in these big structures that, that looked after us in all parts of our lives. There was the there was a certainty that we would have some security somewhere. And now what yeah. we found is it takes one, uh, uh, one uh, pandemic to completely unravel so many of these big structures, the global food chain, uh, of course, the uh, energy supply chain across the world with Ukraine. Uh, and even little things from COVID that no one really thought through was, because of the fact that so many people had to isolate, couldn't be at home, and because of lockdowns, uh, there was a shortage of semi-precious metals, so semiconductors, which are yeah. critical components in so much um, electronic hardware. So there was a shortage of laptops at a time that people needed laptops because they were working from home. Uh, the, the inequality in terms of availability of uh, the vaccines, little things like that, and what it's meant is, in the good old world, if I had instability or tensions or sadness or difficulty at home, I could open up my laptop or I could leave the door and often I would find some solace or some distraction in my work. Or if work was particularly challenging, I could come home and I could find restoration in what I did outside of those hours. Because now in our uh, flexible working, uh, work has driven its bus straight through our front door is sitting in our living room regardless of how carefully we manage it, because many of us will still be worried about friends or family who are vulnerable uh, because of the economic difficulties. Many of people are are caring for older and younger generations more than ever before. So what we have is no escape from anxiety. It's omnipresent. There's there's nowhere to hide away. And that in itself puts us in a very difficult um, position in terms of being able to analyse situations. And that's the particularly because there is often a non-linear relationship being cause and effect. We can't guarantee if we do this, this is what will happen. Yeah. So we find ourselves staring at a part of our lives or at a problem at work going, this is incomprehensible. 
And, and that is so jarring. And the only way to cut through that is to create that that level of psychological safety through trust and warmth. And that that true, we're, we're a social primate. We we are designed to be bonded and in socially bonded groups. And we have to really reach out and make space for that and work hard at it and with purpose, because that gives us the support for our minds to go, ah, what could I do? And what could I do short term often? And not only does that unlock things at work, but more importantly, because it gives us it's a release, a pressure valve for some of that anxiety. It actually allows us to, across our lives, just be better in ourselves. Uh, and that, those simple ideas, you can't do that by algorithm. You cannot do it by Excel spreadsheet and you cannot measure it. And with each person, often it takes the time it takes, I think is the, 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 the counsellor's term for that sort of work. Um, and we try and rush everything. Um, and and so that's why I think that we are facing that situation that you just described. That's why you have this in September 2021, 4% of the working population of New York quit their jobs. It's not that they quit the job market. Some did. Uh, yeah. Obviously, many moved. But in other words, they went, enough of this crap. Uh, life is just too short and too precarious right now. So I'm going to do something that I feel valued in and that gives me some kind of reward, some kind of care, some kind of thought, some kind of kindness. And the previous high was 1.8% in uh, at the summer of 2020 when the pandemic was really um, sort of hitting large, when that level of uncertainty meant loads of people quit too. So 4% of the people went, no thanks. When, and when did the 4%, when did the 4% come just in then? September 2021. So yeah, in one yeah. month, 4% of the working population in New York quit their jobs. Or, yeah, they've, just jobs. Kind of, they've just kind of gone, fuck, fuck it. <laughs> this isn't worth, this that isn't worth it. Enough. I'm not a machine. I'm a human being. I need to be cared for. I want some reward. I want some purpose. So here's the finger. One in 25 went, I'm off to do something that will make me feel valued as a human being. Yeah. What would, what would you say to to somebody listening though that's kind of oh this this sounds a bit namby pamby you know taking it to the other other side of things you know people are going oh being kind da 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 i've got to get shit done it's got to we've we've got to meet these da- deadlines and, and that harder edge because there is that harder edge of performance we're not saying that you know that it's this but this is the counterintuitive bit and that, that i see is is that that actually what those people are going to be it's about being effective but they they said a lot of people might sort of say this has gone the other extreme where it's sort of namby pamby world where oh, everyone needs psychological safety you know it's almost like hugging and keep and making sure everyone's okay what what do you get when you get kick kick back on that uh so my simple thing is do you service your car uh, do you maintain your car? Do you look after it so that it is available to transport you when you need it? And the body, you don't take to a mechanic. You don't just do filters and oil changes. It's it's fundamentally different. We require the emotional connection and that emotional, if you like, wrapping that bonds us. And so why do we treat ourselves so differently to the, if you like, the inanimate machinery or processes within our organization, which often we invest huge amounts of time and money in. But the most important fundamental piece in any organization is its people. And if we don't have the relationships which only come through that kindness and trust, then then what we have is a, a lack of will to take risks, which means also sharing ideas, because there's risk attached to that in terms of people shutting us down or, or lack of dignity, or it's simply not working. Uh, we're far less likely to reach outside of our boundaries in terms of our teams. And, and then you get the, the expressions like them over that they don't understand when we talk about legal or finance versus operations. And we get these, yeah. these holes and these gaps because everyone is just trying to get it done. Um, and it's not only is it in, uh, unbelievably short term and we know the problems that creates it's also no way to run a social group it's, it's as simple as that it's it's not right it's not appropriate it's not sustainable and if we look at our churn rates of people and if we look at the older people who left during covid uh who are not coming back then yeah. we only have to ask ourselves even if you don't see that there is a need to build trust in that way 
the world has changed. And uh, I'll go back to John Amici, who has another expression that I particularly like. And his is, imagine you're that T-Rex who can see the meteor coming towards the planet, which you know will, will spell doom. There's two choices for that great big carnivore. You can eat as many herbivores as you like and then die when the meteor hits, or you can try and grow feathers and then fur and evolve fast. So it, it, it's that. Do you want to be chomping herbivores or do you want to be evolving a part of something new, special and something fit for the 21st century? Um, and if you're not, then there's that other expression, lead, follow, change, you'll get out of the way. It, th there is no room for that idea that kindness is not inextricably linked with operational effectiveness and sustainability. Uh, and that's that's yeah. the key thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, th I was thinking of the word effectiveness. Um, and I was also, uh, uh, do you know, do you know Alex Hill? Do you know Alex? I don't know if you know. Um, I, I was introduced to Dr. Alex Hill. He's actually been on the podcast and I recently read his, his, um, uh, his book's going to be coming out called Centennials. And he did a study of centennial organizations which included the New Zealand All Blacks from the sport area was was basically British cycling, New Zealand All Blacks, um, but it also included he did some he did some work with the Marines. I'm, I'm glad to say, but that wasn't one of the seven that he that he was then researching. Uh, Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, the, these types of organ organizations that over time had evolved and been successful over sustained periods. So there wasn't that short termism type of approach as you're saying, you know, just to, just to fight through. And, and uh, you know, that, that's also something when you talk about them that I've experienced as well, it's, it's people, people are almost like siloed and they can't do something because that doesn't fit with uh, procurement or whatever, or finance within the organization because they've got to show this profitability in the short term without building, um, Build, building robust teams and uh, and high performance teams. What 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 do you say to people though? Because I've got a phrase that's battering around in my head, which is, uh, and I got it from a psychologist as well. But people doing more to be more, and there's this this doing more mentality. If I just do more and push harder and try harder under under stress and pressure, then then you know we'll keep we'll keep getting there. Um, and, and, and this is where the, almost like the courageous piece for me comes in to be able to sort of step away from that, that fear of, of, of gripping on to doing, uh, doing more to be more, um, and, and, and creating the, the, the sort of fertile ground, if you like, that's going to support people to really be effective. What, what do you say when there's, when, how do you sell that to people? This, this different approach, if you like. Well, what I start with, I don't think it's different. I don't think it's new. It's just that we have chosen to diverge from it over the recently, particularly since I argue probably the late 1970s, maybe even earlier. Um, so there was uh, the, the, the Prussian army created the first staff college. And, and the result of that first sort of major piece of work was something you and I would be familiar with called Mission Command, or the mission led approaches, which was used to be successful with the Apollo mission. Uh, the idea of common purpose and unity. Um, but part of that work that was led by a man called Field Marshal von Moltke uh, was uh, actually establishing, identifying what he described as the three gaps, the gaps between um, the gaps that cause a lack of full success or failure of a given strategy. And it's it's based on three confusions. And it's that more, more, more that we need more information. We're going to give you more detail and we're going to give you more metrics because that that'll help us all. And it's a bit like more effort in my life. I'm going to put more things in. Um, but it, it has three great confusions at its heart. And that idea of we confuse information with understanding. More information is not the same as understanding what's going on. Often yeah, accepting that. uncertainty and really making work of creating space to think and look at a situation in depth with the information we have will give far more understanding to our people and ourselves than driving this constant uh, collection of unqualified information. The other is more detail that if I am more prescriptive, I create more detail and more processes and I push it downwards at my people that uh, 
that's greater clarity. It isn't. It's just people are get again get smothered in information, and all these things are paralyzing their ability to think and act upon that thought. And the final one is we confuse metrics with outcomes. This is, this absolute obsession with multiple KPIs and KPOs means we lose sight often of the outcomes. We work to the KPOs, the KPIs. We don't yeah. actually work to the effect that we set out to do. And I think that's exactly the same as people in their own lives. Uh, I had a, a client who really is, you know, works exceptionally hard, um, has a number of things to balance at home too. And road cycling is his passion. Um, but he's fallen out of love with it. And, and asked him to describe his rides. And they all start with looking at his last, uh, the last ride he published on Strava, setting his Strava and looking to beat it. Yes. So even his thing that was very relaxing was about competing against himself. And so for two months, I banned him from ha- using his Strava. So he you know, his Garmin or whatever watch he was using. Others are available. Um, and it completely changed his relationship with the one sort of, if you like, pressure valve he had. Because there was now no, he could now enjoy and just be, and I think we see just being as, in some ways, kindness as as not a operational or revenue driving uh, activity, whereas being, I think, is the essential foundation of being able to have the relationships and thinking to drive that. And kindness is what wraps us together, uh, and kindness to self gives us permission to be the best that we can be. And so these are these are things that are, should be at the centre, but as, as one of my clients called it, but it all sounds a bit woo-woo and Californian until you really practice it. And then you ask, why the hell have I not been doing this for the last 20 years? Um, and, I, and I think that's the sad thing. And I, I said I would... I don't think it's new that, as you alluded to, I spent some time and continue to spend time living with traditional communities. Yes, um, I'll we'll ask you about uh, that. One, yeah. One, yeah, so w- w- one of the communities was uh, were the Konyaks of Nagaland, that, a little state in India. The thing about the Konyaks... Just, sorry, they, sorry, Justin, just just for the for the listeners, I was trying to get you on the podcast, wasn't I? And you, you'd gone off to some tribe somewhere so you, you, you that's what it's so interesting because you go and you go off to these tribes around the world and spend weeks on end with them to really to really get to see this in in different formats exactly yeah so that last trip was um i actually returned in mid-february from the Guianan rainforest which is effectively the amazon to live with a, a people called the yy and the previous trip was to was actually to nagaland the one i was talking about to, to india uh, and there I spent uh, a month living with cognacs who were all former headhunters. So they took heads uh, to promote the prosperity of the village and, and only really stopped in the 1960s. And so I went to interview the last surviving headhunters, the last old men who'd had their face tattooed by the queen because they had taken heads on a, on a raid. Uh, and, and speaking to them, I actually spoke to a widow of one of the warriors who her name was Nagampe and she's 89 years of age. And we were talking about kindness and its place in cognac culture, and it is central. And, and I asked, her, why is why is kindness so important to you? You are people who, and they had been effectively at war with no break for centuries, a minimum of three uh, 300 years. And she said, Justin, it's this. Um, I don't care whether you are king, man, woman, or child, but if you are not kind, why would I ever find a reason to listen to what you have to say? And that was her thing. And they still have these these these, these bloodline kings. But if you're not kind, I, I'm just not interested. And this is a warlike people, you know, incredible warriors with a depth of understanding of the environment which they live. And for them, if you're not kind, your voice is worthless. And that is, if we think about it, if we think about how we respond to people who are not kind, that's pretty much how we all think. And I wonder why in business we therefore make that word as not important or, as you say, soft or or even perhaps weak or not about leadership. Um, and actually, being kind is not being weak. Often being kind means making some very difficult decisions. Wow. That 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 just hits home. Why, why would I listen to you straight away, doesn't it? You know, it's... How, how are you ever going to perform or be a high performance organization that we've worked with? Or if, if that's, you, you know, that I want to come back to the, to your time with the, the tribes and, and, and so on, but 
what what I really want to think of also is that the being more that's you know doing more to be more but being more and again, this this can sound Californian woo woo nonsense bullshit to people, all the rest of it. But um, knowing that it, it leads to levels of performance, you know, I, I, I've got a, a group I was in front of, and I, you know, so tell me about when you're at your best, and they look at me a bit perplexed. And tell me about when you're in your office, whether it's at home or in the, you know, most people now and things, when when everything's just working, when it's clicking into place, and you, you know, and, and that. The key word was effortless. I feel, and these are high high performance states. I batter on about high performance states to people, and people go, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah," you know. But but you ask people whether it's athletes I've worked with, you know, or people in business, and you say to them, "How does it feel?" It feels effortless, and that that really is. I'm, I'm thinking about your guy with his with his Garmin watch. Um, you know, the, the work that I'm doing is is leading towards writing a term of a term I work with a lot is called relaxed power because I've, I've recognized that, that people really be at, are at their best. The, and that guy that's then cycling with more freedom. And I see people running down the road all the time and it's like, uh, and they're killing themselves. And it's like that they're going to enjoy that run or be able to run with any freedom. And you, I, I tried to say this to my girlfriend. I, I said, you know, can you imagine a, I know she's not Mo Farah, but you can imagine Mo Farah going down the road. He is not like grimacing, grimacing his way through that run, um, which sounds like, oh yeah, they're the elite people. We can't do, we can't do those things. But even, whatever cascades level that that is at, ultimately, if we're if we're stressing and forcing and pressuring, then that's going to restrict our ability to be effective. Um, so yeah. The, the being more, being more to, to do more. Um, again, I, I feel like that's something that, um, I mean, go back to the, the question I sort of said is how do you, I want to ask, ask again, how do you develop that with people? How do you open that paradigm up for people for them to be able to uh, maybe uh, see that? Yeah. So, so recently I've been using, uh, a Star Trek analogy uh, to, to, to appeal to people's inner geek. Uh, and it's the, the fact that the USSS Enterprise uh, can do uh, warp factor 9.8, I think it is. It might be 9.9. So that's its maximum speed. But Scotty, the engineer, uh, only allows it to cruise on average at around 5.4 warp because otherwise the engines would blow up. So why do we have this obsession with making our reactors burn at 9.9 .9 the whole time throughout our lives, risking a blow up? And so, so I just use the, the enterprise as an idea. So here's the crew of this amazing set of heroes. But they know they can't run at max, maximum speed the whole time. They run at half speed so that they have that power, residual power, without breaking down. And a lot of people grin and they laugh, but then it makes a bit of sense. And... I just sorry, we were kicked off uh, the recording. There, um, you're in full flow, so I'm gutted. <laughs> you, I don't know if you had any idea where you actually were at, um, but yeah, I, I suppose to. I think to try uh, and, um, we started with the Star Trek, uh, the USSS Enterprise, and uh, not running yes. at nine point nine. And I, I was talking about a client who lives, uh, who, who works for a global organization, uh, and also. Um, uh, has uh, a, 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 has a daughter with special needs, uh, and he he has a, a, a waterfront property where he lives, uh, where he literally can just walk through the, the the garden, and then he'll be on the beach, and he he's and he loves sea fishing uh, because it's a place where you can catch fish, you can eat them. Um, and we were talking about that just the other week that he'd set his rods, but because he doesn't have any time, to, he feels so guilty about making time for himself because of his daughter's needs. His wife works so hard as well to look after their, um, uh, um, uh, their daughter uh, that even a, a two minutes of sitting down, he, he feels he's not doing something. So he sets his rod on a stand. Uh, he doesn't even stand by the rod. Uh, and then if he sees it twitch from the kitchen window where he can actually see it, he runs. And and the other week he, he vaulted over the, the wall because he's in such a rush and he broke his toe because he, he fell. So th th an act of pleasure, which is meant to be putting some fish out to put on the barbecue, even that is so rushed. And we just had a long discussion about 
it's absolutely okay and it's it's in fact it's more than okay it is essential that we give ourselves permission to as you say just be and that means it is absolutely fine to say i need space to myself space where i am just free of the need to do for others so that i can attend to myself and and for him it's really he when he when the rod is set he will stand by it when he's going to catch some fish for the thing so it's that that level of intensity that we we ply upon ourselves um, uh, because of the environment in which we uh, live and because everything is measured. Uh, and, I, and I think that that creating space to attend fully to to be present, not just for others, but for ourselves, that is such an essential leadership trait that no space is given to because it's for some reason, to use an oil, an oil industry term, it's NPT, non-productive time, rather than the essential time that allows everything else to happen. And, yeah, and we yeah. have to get back. To I mean, it goes back to sort of Molkers and the, the mission command gaps, doesn't it? I think the piling on of further information and the if you look at mastery, mastery is a stripping away of complexity rather, rather than something of piling on just more and more and more. Um, yeah, and, and again, uh, there's lots of different examples. I, I, I do use sporting examples, but I, I, I remember Carl Lewis, the great Olympian, you know, that would, that would say run at 80% rather than 100%. There was another guy called uh, BJ Penn who was called the prodigy in, in the UFC, and he always fought, fought to 80% rather than, that's what he would say. Um, and, and then there's also, I was working with this, uh, international boxer that's going to be fighting for a world title this year. And, you know, I sort of, it, it's just, it's loading up of punches and it was like this, this, and it's a very binary, um, example, but I was almost, I sort of said, you know, bring it back to, can you bring it back to a seven? And as he brought it back to a seven, it sort of it allowed a bit more, uh, relaxation and then all of a sudden there was more speed and power and it was it was and he, and he had it's like this newfound toy and all his sparring partners had kind of had come up from Brixton these great big colossal guys and he and I found him then telling them he's going you can do it to a seven you can do it to a seven so you know, well, powerful- we're going to be better at a seven aren't we it's, it's a bit yeah. like in the gym the tendency always to work to your personal best but we, uh, well, I know that my form is n- is nowhere near as good at my personal best as when I work at eighty percent. When I yep. will have the full tension across the movement, I will have the space to concentrate on that form. And actually, so in terms of the work, it is better, not as good for my ego, but I get quality by that reining back and just making sure that I have that that sense of presence in each movement and so i love that idea of running back to seven it's it because it creates space to fully articulate the thing that we've set out to do yes uh, absolutely I, and you know in a as much as you, i'm using sporting analogies it, it is an, an ability to have a conversation for for example is you know again if we if we if we're trying to get something out of it because of the metrics of delivery it then, then that can start to restrict what our natural cap- capabilities. I, I had to sort of mention. There's a guy, guy called Ian, Mc, Ian McGilchrist, who's a. Sort of, yes. um, do you know Ian McGilchrist? Have you heard of him? I don't know, but but his uh, the emissary is uh, yeah. uh, so oh, that oh. whole work around our, our left brain dominance and why that might be and potential uh, neuroevolution over time is uh, yeah he he stands out as somebody's really thought through. Um, why we have compressed to lack that ability to truly understand the periphery and the wider picture. Yeah. So oh, you're, you're the, Justin, you're the first person that's actually heard of Ian McGilchrist as I say his work. So <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I'm impressed, but I'm, I'm chuffed as well. I, I find it hugely fascinating. He's, I suppose he's an Oxford scholar, but he, he wrote uh, The Master and His Emissary. The, the book was his work, wasn't he? But he, but he, was, he was looking at the, the, the left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and how how they function and operate. And that they're involved in everything, but it's how they go about doing these these processes. Uh, and and the fact that he the left brain dominance that he was saying, it's not the pop psycho- psychology of the sixties, but 
what he is showing that the in the in the the left brain the way that the left brain understands things is different and that there's a reason that the 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 hemispheres are whoppingly divided um and he and he he, he talks about the the a technical term but the corpus callosum which which uh, joins the hemispheres is that one of the main uh jobs of that is is inhibition which is basically sort of saying i've got this you stay out of it so that they've, they've both got a, a job and the reason i'm saying all this for listeners is that the, what he describes in in his in his work is that the the left brain dominance where people look at they want to sort of compartmentalize or mechanistic and reductionistic thinking to to put things in a little box if you like almost it is is an effective thing that tool that the the left brain does but the, it's a tool and we need to use it in a broader context of understanding and that's that's really what he's saying that we've lost that broader context sometimes of of perspective that comes with the right hemisphere yeah, it's that idea of that Moss Cantor talks about so so so, uh, so ably is that we have a fixed perspective and we are fixed perspective is normally zoomed in uh, on those short term and the ability to zoom out and see the bigger picture is is exactly the same as McGilchrist's idea of the things that are nuanced, the things that are uncertain, but they give texture and understanding to the thing that we are looking at. Um, yes, and and I think that's the same as relationships. It's if we only use the if we only seek to place effort in the relationships where we need to use them at that moment there's no trust there there's no understanding we're not even it's, it's never as effective as having those relationships built on those conversations without an agenda before we needed them uh, and that and that's why having a coffee with somebody who's not if you like in your organogram but is part of the organization that you haven't met before that's of course, it could be rewarding too, but that's not the point. It's actually about building that that network of trust based on just human to human contact, rather than arriving with an agenda, which is always so obvious if that's what you're there for. And, I, yeah, and I, yeah. that requires that zoomed out perspective to even create space to think about it, let alone do it. Yeah, yeah, um, fascinating, totally fascinating that you that and I. I I knew that we'd be on the same the same track, and so when you recognise uh, McGillcrest's work and uh, and so on, um, it was quite interesting actually. So I was doing some sort of research work, and and uh, th- there was something around Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, which became quite a sort of famous book. But he was he was really in Kahneman was um, Nobel Prize winner, and he was in he was talking about the the intuitive mind, or as McGillcrest talks about. But he was, he was basically sort of highlighting the mistakes and the biases of the intuitive mind. But in the work that I was doing, and I was, I was perplexed because I couldn't understand, for me, I didn't really agree with what he was actually sort of saying. And I, it, to some extent, part of it, but not the whole bigger picture. And I was, I was sort of like, you know, am I, am I missing the point here? And then... Um, so I went with my, my my gut instinct, my understanding, and my research, and and then and then six months later or so, Ian McGilchrist was in conversation with Jordan Peterson, who's a famous psychologist on YouTube, and uh, and Ian McGilchrist sort of goes, "Well, I didn't actually agree with Danny Kahneman's work. In, in fact, I I thought it was 180 degrees the opposite." And I was like, "Oh wow, you know." So. You know, it's it's fascinating, fascinating stuff, and I think I suppose it it underpins this um, this approach of being more. We've got we've got a title almost for this pod podcast, being more to do more, uh, and that that's my my position as well. Just so people that are listening could almost like frame it on something when they listen to, to you. Can I ask you about the military cross and your time in Iraq and and you know some of back to those sort of days if you're if you're happy to talk about them i'm sure you have before but i'm just interested to hear you know the stories of uh, the story if you like of of what took place and I'm, not, I'm sure listeners would would take a lot from that as well uh so that uh, so that particular tour was 2004 in southern iraq in a place called Maisan province uh i was a company commander then so i was a major who who, who was leading 153 soldiers um and we were in the centre of Alamara, which was the provincial capital. And the 
the the battle group, if you like, the regiment that the other twelve hundred soldiers were eight kilometers outside the city, effectively. Um, and uh, there was an uprising during our our tour of of, uh, of, a, of an insurgent group called the Medi Army, who were an honourable foe. These are not terrorists. These are people who who felt that. The, the occupying force weren't delivering in the way that they expected. Um, and so we found ourselves fighting the Medi Army for really the vast majority of our six month tour. In fact, attacks against us increased by a thousand percent. And attacks against my soldiers, I think there were 188 of them. One of those was three weeks long, though. So we were under siege for three weeks in this little location, which was called Simic House, which stands for Civil Military Coordination. So it was meant to be the, 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 the the meeting place between us and local population of the city of 386,000 so that we could understand how we could support them in the beginning a return to normalcy after a year after the coalition forces had invaded their country. Um, so that that's really the backdrop. Um, it was pretty ferocious fighting. Um, I said it was 16 weeks really solid fighting, three weeks where we were completely surrounded. Um, and when we... When we arrived in Iraq, there were 17 Simic houses across the whole country. But after a couple of months, they'd all evacuated, but we'd refused, uh, we'd refused to go. And at the heart of it was because it was such a controversial deployment, I had made a commitment to my soldiers that we wouldn't leave unless we'd left some mark of good uh, in that city, You know that we, just, we weren't going to turn our back when it was getting difficult. And that was something that was really important to them. So that's really, if you like, the, the backdrop of uh, why we were there. Uh, it was part of the 1st Battalion, the Princess of Wales' Royal Regiment Battle Group. Uh, uh, and my company was called Y Company. Um, what the three weeks in particular, Justin, just looking at that, you know, how, how did you, in, in a leadership role there, how, what were, you, were your main focuses and, and how did you manage to... I suppose there's obviously going to be a high level of fear because I presume you weren't getting resourced effectively because you were surrounded. And, you know, how did you, how did you manage to operate and function under that type of pressure? So I, I could be quite careful with my words. I had no personal fear in terms of physical danger whatsoever. Uh, the thing that actually made me physically sick on occasion and almost crushed me on multiple occasions was the thought of uh, sending on another report or writing to a parent or a spouse of one of my soldiers who would be wounded or killed. So that was the thing that was crushing as a weight of responsibility. Um, everything was about my soldier's welfare and the piece that's become more and more evident, I suppose, in the public's mind is one that was so often forgotten is mental injury as well. So uh, I had uh, a test for every one of my soldiers and all of my officers uh, was that if they were about to do something and they were unsure of it, they had to pass the grandchild test. And that was that if in years to come, bouncing a young child on their knee, they need to be able to look them in the eyes and be proud of their action that they're about to do. And if there was any doubts, so they simply not do it, even if it's more dangerous. Um, so that's really what I spent my time doing to, to ensure that when we left uh, that city, we, we would stand tall as human beings, proud of our actions in a moral framework, despite the fact that what we were doing was was fighting people, which by definition uh, breaks so many taboos of what is considered right. Uh, and so, and that, and I wanted my soldiers to leave with that that mental weight at least largely reduced, because they could be content within their own person as individuals in those darker, quieter moments when they were on their own. That they could say, "I have stood tall and proud and acted as a as a morally." Um, uh, as a as a morally responsible human being with real thought and kindness, and uh, as you'll know that there's there's a huge there's a very cruel irony that when we send people to do in human business, uh, we're often astounded by the level of humanity and kindness we experience in a in a combat setting. So that's that was it. It was about vulnerability. 
uh, and I couldn't ask my soldiers to show vulnerability if I was not prepared to tell them my thoughts, my worries, how I was feeling. Um, and so that was the culture that myself and my company sergeant major, Dale Norman, who we still have catch-ups every two to three weeks. Uh, that is that is the, the, what we set. Quite frankly, when it came down to fighting skills, that was just the bottom line. That was for my 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 platoon commanders, so my captains and my sergeant majors and my sergeants. Um, myself as sergeant major just didn't get involved in that. Uh, it was about setting a culture and giving a sense of purpose and making sure that we were always available for those quieter moments for people. Uh, so the sort of things I did were PTSD was, it's ne- well, it's never going to be fully understood, but yeah. we didn't really have the the very the depth of mechanisms and understanding in the military that we do now. It's quite early days in what, as Afghanistan was ramping up on Operation Herrick. And so I, I, I did a lot of research into what causes it. And, and also, I'm a firm believer that everybody suffers from combat stress, whether you're prepared yeah. to say or not. It's the difference whether it becomes more permanent and the impact on your lives, which would be PTSD. Yes. So I, I just had a cardboard box next to my sleeping bag and invited anyone to write, remember the old blueies, but uh, if you're listening to that, before email, uh, we, we used to have free <laughs> airmail letters that we could send back home and we could also, uh, our family and friends could send us. Um, but I, uh, I just invited any of my soldiers that they could write a bluey to myself and the Sergeant Major and put it in this box, a little slip we made, like a little post box, and that we would read every single one. They didn't have to sign it. If they didn't want to sign it, it gave them an opportunity to share anything they felt they could not speak aloud. And they would know that two people would read it together and connect with them. And if they signed it, then I would come and find them and sit with them and just sometimes hold them, just listen to them, whatever they knew they were needed, so that there would be that felt connection of care and kindness that could could just be a little wrap, a little balm for that moment to know that they were not alone. And I think that is that is what leaders do. I, I have this expression with the people I work with is always, are you doing what only you can do? Uh, if you're doing one of your people's jobs, you're not doing the things that no one else can do. And for me, it was that sort of initiative. No one else could do that. I had to be thinking about those things. And so yeah. I let the, yeah. if you like the zoomed in stuff, that just happened and it happened brilliantly because I had, as so many of us do, the most amazing people it's possible to have. Wow. I, I mean, that is wow. I mean, the, the things that you said there, you know, a sense of purpose and then that vulnerability. And I, I wanted to ask you that question because some of the things that we've talked about from the from the start of the conversation is really, you know, about kindness and compassion and the in holding people. And and again, I'm going back to the sort of the hard. You know, someone could listen to this and sort of go wow, that, you know, that really hits and then just like dive back into the, into the, the work environment. Oh yeah, that, that works over there, but I can't do it because now I'm involved in this project X and, and so on. And it doesn't work like that in business. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to sort of underpin that under the most extremes of, of pressure that, that, that can, that can, you know, effectively work and, um, well, is the only way that it's really going to work effectively. Um, I think the only way it is the line. It, it's not a, yeah, if we have time, it's nice to. We know it's important, but... It's not the uh, cherry. It's, the, it's not the cherry. It starts with that. And and for me, it has a huge reach that sometimes we we have no idea how far that shadow of kindness can be cast. And I uh, sort of a year after that tour, in fact, less than that, it was, it was the, the, the summer of 2005, I was, I was leading... Uh, an expedition qualifying some 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 young soldiers and a couple of officers from another regiment as in alpine proficiency so being proficient people in the mountains um, and on the penultimate day before we were due to climb Mont Blanc uh, we were caught up in a, in a huge avalanche uh, triggered by what we call a serac fall so those huge blocks of ice one finds on north faces car sized um, and I ended up uh, uh, upended, suspended by my feet from a frozen bridge of ice across a crevasse uh, with um, uh, very few clothes because we were hurtling down after having successfully summited uh, that uh, just after lunch. Uh, I'd lost my ice axe 
and um, and my feet were literally in two because what had happened is the sheer heat generated by all this ice and snow moving had melted it all and it flowed like a wave over this gap in the glacier this crevasse and hit the cool air and it froze just just like a disney cartoon and what it meant was i couldn't move like i just was hung upside down like a bat uh, but there was a rope between me and the other two people and so i really wasn't that worried because i could hear their voices um, I was getting cold and I, I shouted. No one seemed to hear me. The real change came when about an hour, maybe an hour and a half into it, uh, that rope, that all important connection, that line of communication and trust that is so important on the mountain, that fell through the roof. Uh, and it sort of hit me on the nose. So I was upside down. And as I looked at it, I looked at the end, they'd cut the rope. And as you know, we only cut the rope for two reasons in the mountains. One is we are now a danger to the others because of our weight or, or they think we're dead and they, they just can't recover us at that point. Wow. Uh, what had actually happened was the, the climb in the middle of my rope uh, had been killed. And so the combined weight of our two bodies was fulling, pulling the third person off. So they, they, they cut the rope on us. Um, and I, for the first time in my life, I was mentally and physically exhausted and drained after the tour only seven months before we returned uh, I gave up I just gave up I just allowed myself to flop uh, I had some lung contusion so I, uh, I was breathing poorly and I just let waited to die and in that moment well moments because that would have taken some time I think my core temperature went down to 32 degrees uh, my life didn't flash before me. I, I thought they do on films. It would have been exciting if it did. But certain instances came to life, uh, came to mind. One particular was going back to that operational tour that we just spoken about. And I had just sent a number of reports and spoken to the commanding officer uh, following the death of uh, one of my soldiers called Chris Raymond, who it's not that every soldier didn't matter, but this particular soldier didn't stay at my parents' house because I'd taken him on lots of whitewater kayaking and climbing trips with other soldiers. So even my mum and dad knew him as, as Raymundo and, and, and Chris. And so I was broken. I, I was just not capable of functioning. And I don't know how long I'd been sitting in this little, uh, this little room that we used in this sort of bombed out um, uh, central building as, as uh, my company headquarters. Uh, when I got this this tap on my shoulder, and it was my company sergeant major, Dale Norman, this this incredible human being, uh, Homo Pompeianus, the late Richard Holmes would refer to it, Portsmouth man, uh, and he just gripped me on the shoulder. He's a bear of a man, and just pulled me out the door and propelled me down the outside steps fast because you often get lots of um, machine gun rounds and occasionally sniping rounds and rockets coming in. And I hadn't realised that the blood of, of that young soldier was all across my uniform and really across my face. I'd just been sitting with my head in my hands. And he threw me into the showers. And then as I came out, this, 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 this gentle, wonderful human just handed me a set of uniform, which was his only other set. We only had two sets each. So he, what he was wearing and the thing he handed me. And then he just held me. And he said, boss, you've always said, that we as leaders have to show vulnerability. We have to ask for support in order to give it. This is the last time that you don't give yourself permission to live the words that you command us to do. Live up to your leadership style. Do what you say. And it starts now. And he held me and just allowed me to cry in those moments. And it's that tenderness and that kindness that hanging upside down the crevasse I remembered. And I just... It was really clear in my mind, today is not a day to die. I'm just not dying today because there is this out there and I still want to be part of it. And I managed to do a sort of hall my, uh, to a half sort of sit up, put an ice screw in this uh, this ice ceiling and I tied the end of that cut rope off and that was enough to take the pressure off my chest. And in time, with an hour or so, the peloton gendarme de Montagne, so the high mountain police who were looking for another party, actually uh, found me and, and, and I was rescued. And it's, so when I, I tell this story about kindness not being important, it literally saved my life. But it saved my life 12 months effectively after the incident we're talking about. But because of the thoughtfulness, the consideration and the purposeful attendance of a person who just took the time to make space for me to just be held and 
that's why it matters. That's why it matters, Richie. Wow, let me know. I don't quite know. That was that was an. In- there was two incredible stories interwoven into one, just in there. Um, to actually listen to that is, uh, you know, the the ability of the person to be to be aware enough to actually see that you needed that in that in that moment is incredible to be honest i mean you know in that that in itself as well and to sort of say something to that effect about you living the leadership qualities that you that you espouse and yeah that's unbelievable unbelievable courage i mean it takes huge courage and and the courage that dale showed in that moment shows it's not easy. It's it's a messy business. Yes. He took huge risks in so many ways, but he knew it needed to be done. Uh, and it's a wonderful, incredible act. Without it, I think I would have fallen over. I just don't, I'm not sure whether I would have functioned properly, certainly the next day or for a very long time or ever. Uh, and that that's why it really matters to me. Wow. Yeah, that's... Um... That's that's hugely powerful. I'm like, and then also to get to get yourself out the crevasse. I was like, we're in that story there, and I'm like, wow, we could go down that story. But had and then how do you manage to get yourself out of that that crevasse? And then that that feeling of, I suppose, knowing or accepting death is imminent, or you know, the end of the rope. I mean, what drives you, Justin? Well, I think that. I suppose it's connection. And, and I suspect the reason that I gave up initially uh, w- when that rope was cut was because that was a symbolic severing of connection with others. Uh, so I, I, I think probably that's it. It's, it's I'm driven by connection. There's huge power in relationship and a power and attendance to one another. I also think life's bloody brilliant. Uh, I, I really do. I think human beings are absolutely marvellous. And there is kindness everywhere. Uh, there's... If we go back to our cognacs in um, in, in Nagaland in India, uh, they have an idea called being mat kapu. Uh, so whenever one is thinking about a situation or a about to make a decision, you have to do mat cap is, is the sort of verb. Um, and what they mean is you have to think through the situation and what you might do because we always have to stand for the truth of things and, and as an expression it doesn't translate well but that's broadly what it means but the idea of everything we do is standing for the truth of things including who we are so turning up as ourselves with as little curation as possible enough we should feel we need to feel safe but uncomfortable and turning up with our raw and our best and that idea, have I stood for the truth of things today, is a really important one. And for them, it's just every strand, whether they're a five-year-old child, whether a 101-year-old former headhunter, every day is bound by this idea of standing for the truth of things. And for me, when you ask, how do I do it? I think it's those words gave me an idea of what matters and drives me is I do my very best to stand for the truth of things as they, as that resonates as an idea in my mind. And what did they call that? Mat, was it mat cap, did you say? Yeah, well, the verb is to do mat cap. So mat kapu is the noun. Yeah, M-A-T-K-A-P-U. Um, yeah, so to... to mat kapu. It is the act of mat kapu. It's being mat kapu. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one of the things, again, of vulnerability is that I found in, in different areas of my life, personally, that you know, this thing about authenticity and that, and that ability to, because people sort of say it and then people say they poo-poo it and all the rest of it, but it's like an ability to be our most authentic self in ever increasingly pressured situations. And I have to say, I've fallen foul of that many, many times where you, or people please, or you put a front, a front on it. And, you know, so when I'm hearing the word truth, um, can I speak my truth? And, and be there and present for people in in a truthful, authentic way. Um, I I personally see that as as one of the the biggest challenges of life, really. And and ultimately, if there's a freedom to be to really be ourselves in in those 
and to be our truth. Um, hopefully, I'm not taking this off on a tangent, but it is to say that it, you know it is. It just seems it seems the the epitome of what we're really striving for, so that we can be connected more effectively with with people. Um, but again, it starts with the the internal. And do you, do you think about it in that way? And is that something that you've built from experience and you know your leadership experiences and all the, the tribes' experiences? Is that something that you you, you think of in any moment? Oh, I. I, th- I, th- I think the way you describe it is not only so evocative, but it is a truth in itself that we cannot connect with a mask. We cannot connect with an armour. We can only truly connect to give that level of trust. And if we think of leadership as based on trust to give influence, that's all leadership is. And we can't connect with an idea. We have to connect with a person. So I think one of the critical uh, if you like facets of leadership is allowing others to felt to felt that they are truly seen uh, so that they can turn up as they are and be seen by others uh, because there is there is huge reward and warmth and self affirmation when one feels that somebody looks at you and looks at you with purpose and intent only to listen to what you have to say, but with no other reason than to find out who you are. And and everyone thinks, oh, that's about opening floodgates. Uh, Goffey and Jones, 20 years ago, wrote about why should anyone be led by you? And one of their principles was this idea of selective revealing of vulnerability. So you don't have to expose everything. Yes. You can open the doors enough for people to go, that's your true self. And funny enough, I think you use the word freedom. It's liberating. Yes. And uh, people I work with who go, it's frightening. But when I have allowed myself to be fully seen, it's just so much less work. It's it's because I have to do this all the time. Otherwise, at work. And funny enough, as I say to them, what happened? Did did did, did your team stand on the table and shout weakness at you and, and sort of try and defrock you from your position of leader? Or did they go? Oh, thank God for that. Does that mean we now have permission to do the same? It's it's yeah, that yeah. It, it's a contagion of the best kind. Everyone goes, this has been so shit trying to put a lid on who I am or trying to conform to some ridiculous idea. Yeah. But now I can relate in the way that I'm best equipped to do so in the way that I would like to be. And I feel I can turn up with my authentic self. Now also, it gives me so much energy to get on with a job on hand because there's none of that bullshit that's getting in the way. Yeah, and it's, yeah. It's just God's, less effort for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm thinking as we're, as we're talking here and people are listening, uh, you know, it, it is, it's like there's some real heavyweight words being used and heavyweight stuff where people could say, oh my God, this is like, you know, because we're talking about pur- purpose and vulnerability and all these kind of things. And and it's almost like it, it, it as if it's too much effort to really explore the bounds of what that really is all about, you know. But then again, my the way that I'm driven because actually what how you're doing the way that I'm driven is to is to explore them bounds. What are those bounds? And and it's but I suppose the point I'm trying to make is there's there's a, the heavy words and and so on. But when I use the word freedom, when you cut the bullshit away, then it's like that's like there's a lightness. To that and that and hopefully what i'm really thinking about is that people can start in not just performing but enjoying life a little bit more you know actually sort of like get from this experience you know to to, to live it um and to have some fun you know a lot one of the things that really comes up in high performance teams a lot for me and i think about the lads you know in the sbs there you know it's just it's the the lads that were just the crack with the lads was was beautiful um you know and and it's so it's about fun you know um in anything we do i i was sent some some people last week i was running a session with this guy and i was like helping and support him and he was he was kind of oh you know anything else you think we need to do today with a very sort of intense look and it was we were, we were doing some for some head chefs and, and you know and i said maybe we just need to have some fun and he was like, and he looked at me and went, oh, fun, and sort of wrote it down just to remind himself to, to, have, to have fun. Yeah. 
So there's, a, I think, such a, a positive message in in what it is that we're we're talking about here. Um, well, I'm we aware talk of, about. Uh, go on, sorry, Justin. Sorry, Richie. Um, I was just saying that we 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 talk about the simple hard versus the complex easy. Uh, the the way that we often to to avoid the thing we really must talk about, we will talk about lots of other things that are complicated. We'll come to complex process-based decisions and we or it'd be far easier to address that simple make the decision yeah. and then it's not, I'm not the execution might actually be easy but when that's done everything flows and i remember coming back from iraq having all these ideas of leadership they were always there but i wasn't often brave enough to talk very publicly about them outside of maybe my the the the, the soldiers i looked after uh, some of the officers in the regiment uh you know certain commanding officers and, and people like Dale Norman, my sergeant major, uh, and uh, that, that sort of year later, I'm now the the SO2, so the principal staff officer for leadership at Sandhurst, and I just made a decision that I was doing uh, a talk to about 300, 400 members of staff and officer cadets of the sort of 900 officer cadets that are on station at any one time, and I decided I would stand up and talk about what leadership really meant to me, and I would. I would cut the bullshit. And wow. I felt that the way we wrote about it, I, I know that we felt it and we did it in the way that I experienced it, but we wrote about it in a very different way. It was, it was very clinical. It was, it was really old fashioned. It, it lacked heart. That's what it lacked. Yeah. And so I just said that for me, uh, my experience of military leadership and it, it, for me, it was about an unconditional love for the people around me. You know, and because uh, up until then, I thought there might be some some titters, some giggles because love had been used. I said it was just a love beyond family, a love beyond the idea of love, a love without a single qualification, something so mutual and almost perfection. Um, and I can't describe it any better than that. And I certainly can't give you an equation to make it happen. But it is something magical. Um, and I remember saying those words going, and it really was, fuck, you know, I'm not sure how this is going I had no idea what the response would be. And there was just this, I think there was surprise from the young officer gets, you probably didn't expect words to be used like that in the yeah. academy. But you could see from the staff, there was a, a visible exhalation of those I could see. As And I went, yeah, it's not just me, is it? Uh, and and that, that that simple hard decision to use that 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 phrase precisely just meant it gave me freedom to talk about leadership for the rest of my two years on the staff there. In the way that I would like to, it was liberating. It had lightness, it had levity, but also it was true. Uh, I didn't have to dance around that idea. And, of course, no one laughed. No one said that's a pathetic or a, or, or a soft, that's not real. That Everyone went, it's hard to describe it, but I certainly get that, and I think that is it. And I, I think it's that idea, Richie, that we, we try and even use words as armour about because there's vulnerability in saying, you know what, that's how much it means to me. That's how deep the connection, uh, going back to our cognacs again, they talk about we cry from our bones. So such a visceral, deep-seated molecular connection that that is the impact that we feel. And, and giving ourselves permission to talk that, that does not make us not a good business. That does not make us a not a sustainable public sector organisation. Actually, that humanity makes us, a trusting organisation where people are prepared to say what they're really thinking, which includes yeah. great ideas. You always think it's negative. And also prepared to go, that's why I want to be here. I, that that thing, because um, one of the things that came up with, a, with an organisation was the word risk. Um, and they could see that risk needed to, you know, uh, Mission Command talks about accepting prudent risk. Um you know, and it's, but what I'm hearing is on, on any level, people actually need to actually take risk. And it sounds a stupid thing to say, but it, it needs, and your example there is a moment of risk because there's going to be a lot of, a lot of the stuff ego driven, which is going to say, oh, I'm going to, I'm just going to, and what I'm really talking about with speaking your truth and, and being authentic is, is that moment where you're almost at the, precipices are you actually going to say something which is going to potentially 
unravel into titters of laughter and, uh, you know, and he just said love, uh, this sort of word. So they're, the, they're those moments, actually, when you really, you're on the edge, aren't you? you, you whether it's performance, whether it's delivery, whether it's trying to engage with a group or, or whatever, there, there are moments that it takes that courage. Wow. Well, I think so. The, the the definition of courage that I normally use, just in 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 all walks, in any facet, in any sort of form of discussion, is Aristotle's, and and I I like it because he describes leadership as a balance. Uh, he he considered it the golden value, so it's a, so the most important value of being a human. In fact, he said of being a man because he was a raging misogynist, like any Greek in the the classical era. Um, but the most important value for being a human was this idea of courage. Um, but he described it as finding your golden or pivotal balance point. Uh, and he said, because his definition of courage was drawing a strength from finding the balance between the twin weaknesses of recklessness and fear. In other words, where's your seesaw point between recklessness and fear? Because that balance, that's that's your courage. If you always rush in, that's thoughtless. That's often insensitive. That's not brave. Yeah. But you always walk away. So if somebody says something unkind about someone to someone else, you overhear it and you walk by or, or makes a, an inappropriate joke in a work setting, they're not members of your team. Do you walk away and go, yeah, they're not my people? Or do you go, I'm really sorry uh, I overheard your conversation, but that's not how we talk about people here. That's not our culture. It's not right. And it's those, as you say, find those moments of courage and those moments of clarity to step just off that balance point towards recklessness. And it's the thing about Aristotle, he said, you don't always have to do it. If you always do it, you're not brave. That's your normal setting. That's not courageous. Yeah. Are you always the person that chooses to look the other way or find a reason not to say something? And so for me, it, it is just finding my pivot point. So I know now's the time to step into recklessness. And sometimes now's the time. No, I, I'm going to I've got a big day tomorrow. I've got a big challenge. Yeah. Uh, it's not right. And the thing itself, I can live with it. And and I think that that's at its heart. It's the heart of relationships. It's it, saying courageous thing to a loved one, saying courageous thing to a friend, saying courageous thing to a stranger, doing something brave and taking a risk. But there is no reward without risk. Uh, that it's simple as that. Everything, even putting your your money in a bank account, the interest rate can go either way. So what we're we really investing, we're investing in ourselves for for something rather magical that could happen. Yeah. Uh, and and also embracing uncertainty uh, and this this obsession with working and relating through algorithm as if we can really forecast everything is yes. nothing short of utter madness it's deluded yeah, so yeah. we can do though well we know that if we invest in relationships and we lead with purpose and kindness and full attendance and we create space for ourselves to be at our best we do know that we will be able to tackle what comes and that's different. We don't know what's going to come. That's the, and and we just get the emphasis wrong. I think. Yeah, yeah. God, you sum it. You sum it so well. Just you know, an ability to say to ourselves, "This was a, a psychologist." An ability to say to ourselves, "I can do difficult things," and I <laughs> and I think you know, it's, it, when we kind of have that, and that's that's not something that we can just like logically think of and and just you know say that to ourselves in the moment oh yeah thanks great love that <laughs> but we can we can do it because we've actually put ourselves in those positions and, and and done that so yeah i can do difficult things um you know the the bullshitometer of the brain is not going to kick in and say i don't think you can you haven't got it you you know it's, it's like you can you can ground it in things that i've actually actually done um justin this has been this has been a, a amazing um exploration of I, I know I could talk to you, talk to you for hours. Um, I suppose what, as a sort of parting or getting towards wrapping up here, but what would you, you know, for somebody that's in business, if you had to kind of, I suppose, sum up some of the things we're saying, but somebody within business is going to take something away from what we've, what we've actually said. And, and one of the words we've mentioned a couple of times is action, taking action. Where, where would you see that action and what would you what would you say that some of those um, key takeaways are for somebody to, from this conversation so so I start with a simple idea that purpose plus kindness will give you operational effect more than that 
purpose, that clarity of direction we all need. You add kindness, and kindness would be an operational multiplier, combat multiplier in, in our, our old language. Uh, and it's time to, to think of it as that. And action means it starts with acknowledging it. Until we accept it and really spend time with that idea and go, you know what, I've suppressed this for so long and kidded myself, it doesn't matter. Nothing happens until that moment. And there's a huge irony, of course, we need space and attendance to self before we can come to that conclusion. Uh, so one thing I do with um, uh, with boards is I... I, I I might, uh, if you like, allocate an half a board meeting to just attending to the word kindness. And it's always a gender item one, because obviously it won't get, it'll get rushed. So we're going to spend 30 minutes talking about what kindness means to us. You know, tell me the last time you saw a true act of kindness in the organisation. When last did you do one? Now describe one of the moments of kindness that had such an impact on you on any part of your life. Now tell me how often do you really think of it as something that matters? Or tell me how often you push it back. And there's uh, the, the the last trip you you spoke about when I was in Guyana with the YY. They have an idea that when somebody comes back from the forest having uh, uh, captured some big game, so tapir are often for them, so the big bush cow, as, as they'll call it. Um, in our mentality, that, that would feed their family for, oh, they smoke it for, for a couple of months. And so we would... We would hold it back to reserve for our extended family. What the first thing they do is they will go around the community. It's 310 people who live in 650,000 hectares of primary rainforest. They're the only inhabitants. Uh, and they will go around the, the, the village, uh, which is called Masanconieri, a uh, mosquito place. And they'll shout, on hurrye, on hurrye. And, and, and it's, a, it's a coming together. And it simply means come and share. And, they do that with ideas. They do that with food. They do that with all things. Everything is based on sharing, but they have an utter clarity of purpose. So everyone will, often has this ideas of traditional cultures being simple or simplistic in their outlook. All these people go to school. They have to go to high school. Uh, the earliest they can leave is uh, 17, I think. So they graduate. And it's a British-based system because this is old British Guyana. Um, and so important is this idea of sharing and for them kindness at every level. The chief is a, a democratic chief, so elected every three years uh, and has always been the case, always, centuries. This isn't a new thing. Um, however, they realised that they really wanted to secure the future for their people. They're the only Waiwai who live in Guyana. The other Waiwai will live in Brazil, in the Amazon there, just over the mountains, in fact, it's very a two weeks walk probably from where I was and so their chief from really 2006 onwards uh, well so, no that's not true it started for, probably from about 2003-2004 but, but made, created an environment and understanding and created the skills to negotiate with government which ended up with them being granted their own lands so that 650,000 hectares I speak of has been given to them as a people forever no part of it can ever be sold. No national conservation laws can supersede or change what they decide. Not only is it the largest uh, traditional community uh, tribal lands uh, with, with rights, it is also the largest conservation protected area in all of Guyana. And it's the only, well, it was the first one to be managed by Amerindians. So, these people who have this idea of anharie, so that idea of sharing with kindness and this idea of purpose that cuts through generation, now look after the largest chunk of wild lands and any lands, if you like, it's bigger than most of the states, uh, sorry, states within the country, uh, in this country. And they do that, to, they, to get that, they had to negotiate with the president and the government they regularly have to negotiate with the local state government as well as the federal government. Uh, they in negotiate internationally because it's such a conservationally important area in terms of it, a valuable ecosystem. And they do that with the simple ideas of purpose, kindness and attendance to each other and to share what we have, because with that sharing will always be the knowledge that we will always have enough. And when uh, Harvard was sort of beginning to run 
economics in its faculty before the establishment of its business school. So we're talking about the early 1900s. They had a little tagline, a little byline. It was never official, but it, the idea was profit with decency. And somehow we seem to have forgotten the second part. You can be a very successful business that delivers profit to its people or its shareholders, and you can still do it decently with kindness, and we will all be the better for it. And I think that simple measurement of have we been decent in this? Have we been kind? That's maybe what we should be talking about and thinking about in our boardrooms and across our leadership strata. Wow. I, I don't I, I I almost don't I don't want to add anything just into that because that's um such a beautiful place to finish, I think. And you know, to, to be vulnerable is to say that you it, you've got a beautiful mind. The way that you're you're approaching these um, approach approaching the work that you do, and you know it's an incredible story. I'd, I'd love to do a uh, another podcast at, at some point, and really because people people are probably listening, you know, the the why why and uh, you know and so on. So many things that across the the, the span of what it is you've done, whether it's leadership at, at Sandhurst and um, with the, the the tribes and. And I, and I know you've done other, so many other expeditions. And so, um, yeah, I want, I want to thank you for your time and, and insights. I think it's a really powerful, hugely powerful message for people that, um, that you bring into to the work you do. And, um, yeah, thank you for your time. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to connecting more and, and speaking more with you. But amazing, Justin. Thank you very much. Uh, it generally has been an utter privilege to be invited and to spend this time in your company, Richie. Uh, I've, I've really enjoyed your conversation when we first met, and that's why I was really, really pleased when you asked. Uh, and it's been nothing short of a delight to share what's clearly a joint passion and this idea of leadership. And I do hope that we continue our conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's next for you? Have you got Have you got any um, expeditions planned, Justin, or are you taking a bit of time because i know you're, got, you're a busy busy man yeah and also uh, i i can't i can't talk about attending to self and then always be what's next so i, I do <laughs> yeah. one thing i've learned in my 50s is to is to take some of my own medicine so i i am creating space uh i have got a couple in mind um i one thing on that trip that i uh i found about was this idea of the jaguar people so people who could turn into jaguars by day and uh, normally by night but by day and by night uh, and they that would include some related tribes to the YY uh, and one of the old YY men knew people who could turn into Jaguars so in my mind uh, there is an idea of what will be a very extended uh, forest expedition living off the forest a number of weeks carrying pack rafts to then go to this particular uh, uh, river and to then investigate the people who live alongside it who are meant to be uh, potentially some of the Jaguar people so that, that's something in my mind anyway <laughs> wow wow I'm sure, that, I'm sure that there needs to be a book coming as well if there's not already. <laughs> you won't be the first to say it. Maybe one day. <laughs> it's got to be. But, uh, yeah, again, thanks for your time, Justin. And, uh, yeah, look forward to carrying on the conversation. But, yeah, great, great to speak to you. It's been a genuine pleasure, Richie. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. 